Fox's ongoing Virtue Town Hall series, We Keep Us Safe. Tonight's program addresses the deep-rooted issues of incarceration and the probation and parole systems and maps out a pathway towards decarceration. My name is Luis Hernandez and I'm the National Director of Youth Campaigns and Leadership here at The Gathering for Justice. For those of you who don't know, The Gathering is now in our 15th anniversary year. We were founded by the legendary Harry Belafonte in 2005 after he saw a story on the news about a five-year-old black girl in Florida being handcuffed in her kindergarten class for throwing a tantrum. To address the realities of criminalization of black children, Mr. Belafonte brought together elders of the civil rights movement and youth from across the country to form a covenant to end child incarceration and dismantle the systemic racism in our justice system. Since then, we have worked on various campaigns, including the Free Meek Mill campaign, centered on probation reform and parole reform, something we will address this evening. The Raise the Age campaign, which successfully raised the minimum age New York children can be charged as adults. The Justice for Eric Garner campaign, and more recently working on campaigns for Akbar Rogers in Long Island, Jacob Servin in Stockton, California, Sean Motorosa in Vallejo, California, and Alvin Cohen in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, among others. But let's get this program started. I'll be back a little later in the program to lead a discussion around youth probation and detention reform. But for now, it is my honor to introduce my friend, my big brother, my Justice Against NYC comrade, Stanley Fritz, who will be moderating our very first segment of this program. Stanley is a highly respected community member, writer, activist, political operative, and podcast personality who's been working to build political power in black and brown communities for the last 10 years. He currently works as a New York State political and campaigns director at the Citizens Action of New York, a grassroots organization that fights for economic, social, and environmental justice. Stanley is also the engineer and co-host of the award-winning radio show and podcast, Be Heard Talk, which focuses on race, politics, and culture. In addition, Stanley is the co-founder of Let's Not Be Trash, a platform that encourages men to stop patriarchy and an active member of Justice Against NYC. Furthermore, he is the author of two self-published books. So Stanley, I want to welcome you. Are you here on screen? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks a lot, bro. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Lewis. Listen, if I was as brilliant and as active as you were when I was like 17, 18 years old, man, listen, you are a beast and I really appreciate you and everything you do. So first off, good evening, everybody. Very happy to meet you all. I won't go into my bio because we don't need to hear all that. But just one more time, my name is Stanley Fritz. I'm going to be moderating this panel and I'm very excited to be here with all of you. I um, mean, I'm really grateful for the Gathering for Justice for having me this evening. I've been a part of this organization for the last four years and hopefully for a long time coming. And I've been a part of these previous conversations. And the reason I'm a part of them is because it's important that we keep us safe. And it's important that we have these Keep Us Safe Town Hall series to amplify the issues that are impacting our communities and impacting people who are returning citizens, who are formerly incarcerated, or who are family members of those who are formerly incarcerated. We have a large and incredibly smart and resourceful panel. So let me stop waxing poetic and get to the people we have here who are gonna drop all kinds of gems. First off, I would like to introduce Ramin Amenzadeh. Ramin is a community organizer and activist, a filmmaker with 23 years of experience as a director, editor, and producer in the entertainment industry. He is also the founder of Beats, Rhymes, and Relief. Ramin brings his work as an artist and activist together in powerful projects, including his documentary, Bigger Than Water, which you all should watch. It's about the Flint water crisis. Formerly incarcerated, Ramin has a personal and familial experience with the criminal legal system and has an older brother who was just unjustly incarcerated in Maryland and recently released due to COVID. As you know, if you're in New York, the number of incarcerated people dying of COVID exposure in New York is breathtaking, and we need to address that. Next up, I want to introduce Rodney Holcomb. Rodney is a lawyer and a journalist by training and committed to creating a more just and compassionate world for all people, particularly those subject to the criminal legal system. Originally from Hudson, she's in Houston, Rodney is a graduate of Howard University and the University of Pennsylvania Law School. He is a member of the California State Bar. Rodney is also the state director for criminal justice reform at forward.us, where he engages in state level criminal justice policy in New York. In his role, Rodney advances legislation to decarcerate jails and prisons across New York State. Prior to forward, Rodney was a staff attorney at the Drug Policy Alliance in Oakland, California. And Rodney, is your camera on? 
All right, great. So we got Rodney here and we have Ramin. Next up, I want to introduce Miss Donna Hilton. Donna is a woman rights activist, criminal justice reform advocate, and accomplished public speaker. She is the author of A Little Piece of Light, the autobiography which tells a heartfelt and harrowing story of Donna's journey back to life after facing the truth, excuse me, after facing the truth about the crime which locked her away for 27 years. After her release from prison, Donna founded A Little Piece of Light an organization that advocates for the rights and well-being of women and girls who have been impacted by intersectional trauma, such as violence and sexual abuse and assault, domestic violence, police brutality, and incarceration. Thank you for being here today, Donna. Next up, we have Jose Hamaz Saldana. Jose is the director of the Releasing Aging People from Prisons Coalition, also known as RAP. RAP is a grassroots community organizing and advocacy campaign co-founded by a collective of formerly incarcerated people. RAP works to end mass incarceration and promote racial justice through the release of older people from prisons and those serving long-term prison sentences. Jose is formerly incarcerated. He is a resurrection study group alumnus, co-founder of several therapeutic programs, including a challenge to change, a comprehensive approach to addressing criminal thinking, behavior and attitudes, and he's a recipient of the 2019 Freedom Fighter Award issued by Citizens Against Recidivism. Then we have Ms. Topeka Sam. Topeka is a founder and executive director of the Ladies of Hope Ministries, co-founder of Hope House New York City, president of TKS Ventures LLC and Faces and Voices Inc. She served on the board of Grassroots Leadership Coalition for Public Safety and the Marshall Project. Since her release from federal prison in 2015, Topeka has been a 2015 Beyond, Bars, Beyond the Bars Fellow and 2016 Justice and Education Scholar from Columbia University, a 2017 Soros Justice Advocacy Fellow, a 2018 Unlocked Futures Inaugural Cohort member, and so much more. Topeka's been busy. Topeka is host of the Topeka K. Sam Show on Sirius XM Urban View Channel 126, Sundays at 9 a.m and is developing scripted and unscripted series as an executive producer for TV and film. Topeka, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. And the, next up, one of my favorite people, um, and before I go into his bio, I just wanna say, if you have not seen his victory speech for Public Advocate, you should absolutely watch it. After I watched it, I went and found a therapist. So next up is New York City Public Advocate, Jemai D. Williams. As I said before, he is the public advocate of New York City. He previously served on a New York City Council representing the 45th District. Jamani is a first generation Brooklyn of Grenadian heritage. He graduated from the public school system, overcoming the difficulties of Tourette's and ADHD to earn a master's degree from Brooklyn College. He began his career at the Greater Flatbush Beacon School and later served as the executive director of the New York State Tenant and Neighbors Association. And the New York City Council, Jemani championed landmark legislation that fundamentally transformed policing in New York City. As public advocate, Jemani continues to be an activist elected, excuse me, an activist elected official who brings the voices of everyday New Yorkers to city government and makes New York a truly progressive beacon for all. And in a New York City Council where respectability politics was very popular, Jemani was vocal against the police and he was one of the only council members at the time to wear his dreads comfortably. That was really taboo in the early 2000s. I want to give a second to acknowledge the, the public advocate. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you, man. Peace and blessings. No problem. No problem. And now, last but not least, someone else who I, I think very highly of, and I think you all will as well, Natasha Williams. Natasha is a well-respected political strategist and policy whiz who works tirelessly for communities across the country. In 2014, she was appointed the executive director of the New York State Black, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, and Asian Legislative Caucus, one of the largest and most influential political entities in the state of New York. Because of her work, Williams was honored as one of Albany's rising stars, top 40 under 40 by city and state, and later went to run for the New York State Assembly seat in Southeast Queens in 2016. Her fight for women's rights and racial justice led her to organize one of the largest demonstrations in American history, the Women's March on Washington, as a national organizer in 2017. 
Currently, Natasha is preparing the official announcement of her campaign for city council in New York's 27th district. Natasha, very happy to have you here today. Thanks for having me. And I'm gonna kill Jules because I know she did that bio. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you got to step into your greatness, beloved. So folks, this is an all-star panel that we have over here. These amazing people with even better stories and so many accomplishments. We're all going to be very excited to talk to them and hear what they have to say. But let me set the landscape for you. Mass incarceration was already a public health crisis before COVID-19. For those of you who are in New York State and have been paying attention, there was a very ugly fight to stop the New York State legislature from rolling back the bail laws they had just passed the session before. Unfortunately, it was a losing fight. Despite that, we were entering a rest of a session that looked like it wasn't going to be good for issues dealing with reforming or shifting power away from the criminal legal system. And then COVID hit, and it laid bare the deadly nature of incarceration and requires us to look more critically and intentionally about how the incarceration system, jails and prisons impact our communities. This segment is hoping to talk about that and will be broken down into several parts. The first, the panelists will describe the crisis unfolding in New York prisons and jails, both before and during the pandemic. And then we'll shift the conversation to solutions and next steps for addressing the crisis. So now that folks have the landscape, I want to throw it straight to the panelists and I want to go to Jose first. Jose has been doing a lot of work with rap, particularly around elder parole. Jose, we've seen hundreds of articles over the course of the pandemic on a COVID crisis unfolding in prisons across the state. And it's only getting worse. While the governor goes on his book tours and talks about how well he's handled the crisis, we're seeing numbers spike all across the state and in prisons, they're spiking at, at numbers higher than anywhere else in the country. Please describe the crisis in New York state prisons generally and the harm that's been wrought during COVID-19. Well, first, let me give you just give a couple of seconds of background. In the last 10 years or so, 1,000 incarcerated men and women have died in New York State prisons. 700 of those were elderly people, 50 years old or over. The vast majority were people of color, Black and Latinx people. The age of death is an alarming 58 years old. So for years, and sometimes decades, people in prison, in New York State prisons, especially the elders, have been confronting a health crisis for years and decades. So this is the condition that COVID-19 hit New York State prisons, a condition that everyone, everyone in Cosby in New York State is subject to subpar health care, the elderly especially. So when COVID-19 hit, we knew that the elderly, we didn't have to be told by experts. We knew that the elderly were going to be vulnerable to this virus. I've languished in prison for close to four decades. And I knew that some of the men I left behind were had health conditions. If they ever get sick, the likelihood is that they will not make it. And I also knew from languishing in prison all the decades through the HIV AIDS pandemic, the hepatitis C pandemic, the outbreaks of tuberculosis. I knew, we all knew that the Department of Correction will not handle this as a health crisis. They will not handle this as a human crisis. Their only response to every health crisis that ever hit the New York State prison system was punitive, to punish people take privileges and rights away, and that's exactly what they did. The first thing they did was suspend all visits, take privileges away, suspend all visits, uh, uh, assuming that the only way the virus was gonna spread in New York State prison was to our visits. They were wrong. It spread because of their correction officers. Their correction staff brought this virus, this deadly virus into the prison system. And we also knew without any question that they will be deprived of PPE. We knew that with certainty. So we advocated and organized our communities to demand Governor Cuomo, who paraded that prison labor was making this hand sanitizer that he was not allowing those incarcerated to use. So it was through the advocacy, advocacy community that he allowed the hand sanitizers to be used by those who, who were making them and all incarcerated people. 
and we advocated for them to have masses, which they were not allowed. Actually, they were being punished to make for, for, for making masses from handkerchiefs that either they got through the package room or they were issued by the state shop. So we 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 understood that this is the process that 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 the Department of Correction uh, functions are very punitive in nature. They are not concerned with the health uh, lives or the humanity and dignity of incarcerated people, in particular Black and Latinx people. So we had to advocate for every single uh, preventive measure that they actually have today. And we're still advocating because they're only giving them a mask for every every two or three weeks. So we're still continuing to advocate for PPE for incarcerated people. Now, the one response, and they glorified this response, Governor Cuomo and the uh, Commissioner of Correction actually concoct a concoct of a, of a plan to take 125 elderly men, 65 years and over, all with underlying health conditions, and put them all in a facility called at around that correctional facility. And 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 and, and the, the 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 disgusting thing about this plan is that they were taking these elderly people from hotbeds that had the worst COVID cases in the state, taking them from these hotbeds and transferring them to a facility, all 125 elderly men, without even testing a single one of them. Jose. Not a single one was tested. Jose, very yeah. briefly. But they were taking these men to this place, not testing them at all. Were they informing their families at all? No, absolutely not. No? Absolutely not. These men didn't even know where they were going. They were just scooped up out of nowhere, uh, thinking that, you know, when they when they scoop you up, like I know from experience, man, you know, you, you don't know where you're going. They're not telling you where you're going until you get there. And they're wondering what the hell they're doing there. So here they are, sending them all there. And now, again, we advocated for them to first, our, our first demand from the governor was to grant these, instead of transferring all of them into a, a prison nursing home, and we were, we were terrified that it would result in the catastrophic impact that the nursing homes in the city were, were, were resu resulted in. We were concerned, some of them we knew personally, we were concerned that a case uh, would were, were, were spread. It would spread among all these elder people with underlying health conditions and it will produce needless dying of elder people. So we demanded that instead of transferring them all to a, a prison, uh, turning this prison into a, a prison nursing home, that the governor at least start the process of granting them clemency as the only humane solution to this crisis. And instead, what he did, he just housed them in there and as an alternative to at the least test them test them so we know for sure that nobody there is infected that could spread the disease amongst all these elderly people. And sure enough, once they start testing them, they discover that there were some positives. And, and, and have, have we not did, did this? Hold on, I gotta, I gotta stop you for one second because we gotta, we gotta open up everyone. I can't hear you. Um, I wanna go to Jamani for a second. So, um, okay, Jamani, you know, before COVID, before we passed the bail law that got rolled back this past session, we knew that over 40% of the people that were going to Rikers and sitting there had not been charged of anything at all. Now, they shifted, they changed the bail law again so you can put more people into those jails. And what we're seeing is that there's a rising number of people ending up in the jails in New York City, even as we're having a pandemic. What does the crisis look like at the city level? And what are some things that like you think should be done? Well, you know, first of all, I want to make clear that the things you're talking about are happening wasn't Donald Trump and it weren't the Republicans. These are Democrats. Now, here in New York State, Governor Andrew Cuomo and Mayor Bill de Blasio have made situations worse. Uh, and COVID, as you mentioned, didn't create these situations. Um, they have made them worse and magnified. And so, you know, while I'm happy that we got rid of Trump, that for me was... Uh, stopping uh, the bleeding. But if you don't continue on with the triage, you can still lose the patient. And I, I gotta say, you know, I, I appreciate what Biden Harris did, what they come bring to the table. Harris, what she represents for black women in particular, it, it stand alone. Uh, but those weren't my first, second, third choices. So we still got a lot more work to do and uh, in that triage. And this is part of it. The way our system is set up is simply based on fear. 
It's based on creating fear that primarily black and brown people, low income people, uh, will harm you if we don't lock up as many as possible. Uh, that's all this is really about. And it's so focused on retribution and punishment to people who are labeled the other. There's nothing about rehabilitation. And that we always kind of put into play that we have to have these structures. Oh, you won't be safe, you won't be safe. But in the 1990s, it was probably upwards of 15,000 or more people in Rikers Island. We've cut that almost in half. Uh, and we saw a decline of crime, it's almost 78%. We see a spike now in certain crimes and we can talk about that, uh, why. But other than that, crime has gone down. Uh, so this mass incarceration did not do what people said it was supposed to do. And there's a link to always believing that public safety is locking up as many black people as possible, black and brown people, put as many cops as possible and putting folks in jail. It just doesn't happen. And our country, we are about 4% of the population, about 25% of the people who are locked up on planet earth are locked up in this country. Um, and that's a real thing. So one of the things I'm hoping we can do is really start changing the definition of what public safety is. Very often public safety equals more police, equals uh, putting people in jail. And we have to redefine what that is. And if we can actually redefine uh, what public safety is in a real way, then we'll start changing the dynamics of, of this conversation. Thank you very much for that, Kamani. I want to throw it to Rodney real quick. So Rodney, you've been doing this work, obviously. Um, and over the course of the entire pandemic, one of the only laws, if not the only law that passed related to can you describe these rollbacks and what they now mean for bills across New York State? I think I lost the last half of that question, but I think it was related to bail reform, so I can definitely speak to it. So, I mean, as we know, in 2019, New York, I mean, went further than most other jurisdictions. In fact, I think this might have been the most liberatory of all of the laws uh, with respect to bail reform. Uh, bail reform uh, in New York meant that 90% of charges uh, would not result uh, in pretrial incarceration. In fact, there would actually, actually be mandatory release uh, in the vast majority of cases. So, you know, what this meant in practice, uh, once the law went into effect on January 1st of this year, is that uh, the jail population went down by 45%. That is incredibly significant. We're talking about jails all across the state that are extraordinarily packed uh, and are dangerous and even deadly places outside of a pandemic, uh, let alone in one. Uh, and so we were, you know, beginning to see like a fundamental shift. Um, but as with many criminal justice reforms, uh, there comes the vitriolic uh, pushback. Um, and we saw that in New York, uh, on 100 to, you know, be completely frank, uh, we saw so, so many lies, so much fear mongering and so much, um, you know, frankly, so much racism uh, coming through the media and being peddled by law enforcement and anti-reform uh, elected officials. And uh, that inspired rollbacks that uh, were passed as part of the state's 2020 budget that subjected far more people uh, to pretrial incarceration. And so, you know, while at the beginning of the year uh, and through the first several months of the year, we were beginning to see a decline in the jail population, which was incredibly important as we started to enter a pandemic like nothing we've ever seen before in our lifetimes. Um, on July 3rd, uh, those bail reform rollbacks went into effect. Uh, and since July, the pretrial incarceration rate uh, in New York has increased. Uh, in fact, the pretrial jail population has increased by about 19%. Uh, that is um, and should be extraordinarily alarming. Um, we, you know, across the state and jails and prisons are continuing to see outbreaks uh, of COVID-19. Um, you know, as recent as earlier this week at Wyoming Correctional Facility uh, upstate. Um, and this should be extremely alarming. Uh, that means that people who were not sentenced to die behind bars are subject to a virus that could kill them um, before their release. And I mean, you look to the stories of so many people. I mean, Leonard Carter, for, exa Leonard Carter, for example, who had been granted parole uh, and died before his release date, weeks before it, because he contracted COVID-19. 
And I think that's extraordinarily harmful and extraordinarily shocking in a state that uh, is forward thinking um, or alleges to be forward thinking. Uh, and that's something that we really, really critically need to address because this crisis is worsening. Uh, we're seeing outbreaks across the state in correctional facilities day after day. We're not seeing folks get multiple tests um, and social distancing in correctional facilities is near impossible in most circumstances. And, you know, if if the virus is worsening on the outside, we can only expect it to be even worse uh, in correctional facilities. And I mean, everyone predicted this before it happened. Everyone said it, advocates continue to say that. Um, but you know, the changes didn't come as quickly and as forcefully, forcefully as they should have. Uh, in fact, uh, the state of New York released far fewer people than even some Republican led states or conservative leaning states. So, you know, we're in a crisis that is only worsening. Um, and unfortunately, far too many more people will be subject to this virus. We, again, don't even really know the long term impact of what this virus will do to folks. Um, and more people will unfortunately die. Um, like uh, Lulu Bensensier, like uh, Benjamin Small, so, so many people have been subject to just grave harm. Uh, and it's something that frankly should be prevented and could have been prevented long ago. Thank you so much for that, Rodney. I'm gonna go to Natasha. Natasha, obviously like your community is a community that's majority black and brown. Um, most our, those communities have mostly gotten incarceration and not much COVID supports. If you had things your way, you were elected into office, what kind of supports would you want for your community during this moment right now? Yeah, um, so on the COVID end, um, we really don't have a lot of medical centers. There's only like one hospital, right? So when you talk about um, places to receive proper healthcare, we don't really have that in our community. We either have to go out into Long Island we have to go to um, one of the local hospitals. So one, we need to increase um, our health options um, in the community. Um, and one of the reasons why my community was hit hard by COVID is because a lot of the people that live in my community are deemed essential workers. So they're police officers, they're corrections officers, um, they are MTA workers, they're teachers. Um, I think I said teachers already. Um, so we need to protect our essential workers and make sure they also have all the resources that they need. But as a board member um, of a gun violence prevention organization, Life Camp in Queens, I think we really need to find more resources for cure violence programs, right? And crisis management, preventative measures. Um, how can we ensure people are not continuing to be funneled into the justice system? They have their needs met. So it's, I'm a firm believer that everyone that is incarcerated probably had some type of need, right? And so how do we address the need um, to allow for them to remain out of, of jail um, is, is some of the things that I'm looking at. Another issue in my community, we don't have a lot of places for our youth to go. Right. So when we talk about gun violence, when we talk about gang violence. Well, if there was actually a productive and safe place for youth to go, perhaps they might not go on a street corner um, and, you know, chat it up with the bloods. Right. <laughs> like maybe they'll go play basketball at the local community center if that existed. Um, so for me and what I'd like to see in my community is continuing to invest in organizations like Life Camp that I am on a board of, but then also um, looking at other other ways to ensure that we are preventing um, folks from being incarcerated. Thank you so much for that, Natasha. I want to throw it over to Topeka. Um, you know, we realize COVID-19 is having a harmful impact on all people, but particularly women, both formerly and currently incarcerated in jails and prisons across the state and the country. Can you describe some of this harm and how systems um, impact women, particularly Black women, um, through just regular racism and and misogyny and patriarchy? Sure, um, well first, happy anniversary and happy birthday to the gathering um, on 15 years of incredible work. Um, and just to add you know, to everything that everyone said, and I wanna also leave space for Donna and the incredible work that she's also doing in New York. But what we're seeing with women specifically, whether it be in New York or all over the country, is that we know that we are marginalized. We know that our health issues are um, more than even men, right? We have different um, asthma, diabetes, hypertension, um, different maternal issues, whether it be within uterine issues. Um, and when women are in prison and they don't have the things that they need, to everyone's point, they're released sick, they're released without PPE, they're released without these things, and then they're released trying to get their children back, who are then 
not in school, not um, or not able to be at home. Um, they become far, farther disadvantaged, farther marginalized, further harmed. Um, what we're doing here, I'm in New Orleans right now, as a matter of fact, and we purchased a home during COVID because women weren't being released from prison um, because they had to be kept in prison. They said they didn't want to release them sick and then they had nowhere to go. So we try to combat that by getting a house. Um, and then doing that, decarcerating efforts, getting them out and trying to keep them out, working with the probation and parole systems, making sure that they have safe and affordable housing, helping to make sure they have places for their children to go, connecting them with community-based resources, social services, direct services, so they have holistic care, um, making sure that the children are having the things that they need because, I mean, let's face it, they're not in school. Either they're going to school and they're getting sick, they're home, and then the parents are home, nobody's working, everybody's just, it's, you know, I can just ramble on about this, but I mean, in the end, it's like women of color, we always are, are left out of the conversation. We always have minimal resources. We always are the ones that have to fight for our own voice. And, you know, we're doing the work. We're trying, um, to Natasha's point, making sure that community-based organizations are getting funding um, and resource well in order to make sure that we're able to help with these bills that are being passed. I mean, legislation is great. We fight, all of us, I think, on this call, do legislative advocacy. But in the end, um, when people are released from prison, if they have nowhere to go, they don't have uh, food, they don't have shelter, they don't have sustainable opportunities for employment, then it's going to be this perpetual cycle of violence and abuse. And you know, we're doing the work to make sure that we are starting to combat that um, and more organizations and women who are directly impacted are leading these efforts as well. Thank you very much. I want to throw the same question to Ms. Donna. Thank you all. Thank you for having us and having this conversation is important. So to piggyback on um, what everything everyone said, but definitely what Topeka was just um, bringing um, to attention, I think there's something we have to talk about, like the pregnant women, right, that um, are incarcerated. So here in New York, um, you know, what was interesting based on our um, less is more efforts at legislation that, um, you know, I co-lead and help draft to stop reincarcerating people, stop sending people back to prison for not committing a crime, right? Just having issues, right? We're talking about poverty is a crime, you know, that's violence, poverty is violent. You know, mental health, you know, with the lack of treatment for that is violent, you know, this perpetual um systemic um, violence that we continue to see and, and we wanna weaponize those things and criminalize it, right? So when it came to the pregnant women, you know, we had a great concern about them. You know, what's going to happen right now to, you know, um, to Vika's point about women having um, more or different, we have unique issues, right, as women. And then, you know, if you're pregnant, <laughs> you know, there a lot, there's a lot tagged on to that. So what's gonna happen with these pregnant women? And so we, 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 um, we were successful, a little piece of light was successful in um, getting the release of seven women, seven pregnant women out of Bedford Hills, right? Because that's usually where the pregnant women are housed in New York State. And then unfortunately one was reincarcerated because she had a substance abuse issue. So during this time of COVID, we're talking about sending people back to prison because they have substance abuse issues or um, they have uh, mental health issues or they can't get a job. How do you put somebody, how do you tell someone they're on work release? And, then, and, and no one can get a job right now. I mean, the majority of the country, right? Is getting um, assistance at this time. So how do you tell a person that's, that's trying to get out of prison trying to get a job if they don't get one during this time that they're gonna be sent back to prison? I, I had to fold in and, 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 and embrace two women specifically so they wouldn't get sent back to prison at this time. You can't save everyone, but you try to do your best, right? And we're under-resourced, right? We continue to be under-resourced and we overlooked in this, in, this, um, in this movement, really, and in the issues that we, we have and we need, we so desperately need help with. And so, you know, we talk about pregnant women, we talk about women that are aging, aging out. People, women that have been there for decades. I spent 27 years there. Women that are still there. I did time, but they're still there. Can you imagine the health disparities that they're going through? Health was an issue before they got to prison. There's no great, I mean, adequate health care in a lot of our communities. 
It's subpar. So imagine going into prison and not supposed to treat something or do something. No, we have women being released that almost died in prison, have severe, um, I mean, cancer. We talk about terminal conditions. So what do we do with that? But we're not hearing that. And the governor had promised 1,100 people would be released based on our um, efforts behind less is more. And we got 740 something released out of that, never 1,100. But out of the 746, over 400 was returned back for not committing the crime. So then when you tie into what Rodney was saying about the rhetoric that was, um, you know, the vitriol that was um, put out there to public about, oh, violent criminals and all the rapists and all this stuff. No, <laughs> no, that was never true. That was just fear. And we know fear is what we use to manipulate people into doing what we want them to do and to get where we want to go. And that's all this is. And that's why things like this are important because we don't talk about those who are most susceptible and most impacted by this, the elderly. We won't even talk about the elderly um, in the nursing homes. Hello, <laughs> that didn't turn out well either, right? And that's a system, nursing homes are systems, right? So we have to look at all these things, it's layered. And we have to figure out how to do better, but we're not gonna get there if we continue to fight our own and to Rodney's point, Democrats, who, can, who say they're progressive and understand this fight and want to get on the bandwagon. And then as soon as this something is thrown out, they get scared, they jump, they oh, I don't want to. No, that's not how this works. That's not helping us, your constituents, your community. It's not going to work. Not going to work at all. And they're suffering the consequences for it in elections. We're getting more progressive. That's, that's why we, we registered over 2,000 people in New York City alone, we created a coalition. We got the registered people on parole who didn't know they knew um, that they could vote. Hmm. Got them to vote. We will vote you out. I promise you that. There we go. So I want to move it on to Ramin. Ramin, you have experience with an immediate family, family member contracting COVID behind bars here in New York. Can you talk about that experience and what the process looked like to get him home? Yeah, so, you know, uh, my brother was uh, wrongfully charged a couple years ago, given a 14 year sentence um, and sent to a jail actually in Maryland, um, in Baltimore. Uh, so notorious uh, facility called, uh, used to be called Central Laundry, now they've changed the name, but this is basically where the, the jail had been condemned twice before because of the conditions inside. Um, it's a laundry facility that washed the clothes for you know, uh, multiple facilities in the area, including the psych ward. There was like three or four different breakouts um, and they were still forced to go to work every day and wash these clothes. And their one attempt to try and sanitize the clothes before workers walked inside was to leave the bags of clothes on the outside dock of the building where every prisoner had to walk through to get to the job. So you were passing through it every day, you were handling it every day. They set it out for 24 hours. That's what started the outbreak in his jail. Uh, started out to be, you know, um, people are getting sick, people are dying, 12 people died within his own dorm. Um, folks were, you know, scared to death to even uh, say that they were sick because what would happen is they would take you from the dorm and then put you in a smaller enclosed space where, and they weren't testing, so whether or not um, you had it or not, you would then be guaranteed to get it. Um, and they weren't taking people to the hospital because, uh, again, the numbers and, and we had a Republican governor who wasn't really um, into releasing those numbers. So, you know, uh, being formerly incarcerated myself and, and spending the last, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 years working with the Gathering and Justice League, you know, we just use some of the some of the tactics that we've learned um, playing that inside out game. Uh, had a few um, uh, congressmen that, that I've worked with over the years developed a campaign um, for folks to call the caseworker, to call the lawyer, to call the judge. There were supposed to be a series of modification hearings um, and, and uh, parole hearings and all of those things coming up for him. Um, and because of COVID, it was all canceled. It was supposed to go virtual and then did not. Um, so having a small dedicated team to consistently every day call and 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 reach out and not stop until they got someone on the phone and started to explain the circumstances that we were hearing from inside the prison like how are you going to hold all these people in this facility where 
they're forced to go to work every day in this laundry group handling sanitized clothes with no mask, with no glove, with no testing, with nothing. And then when we call to get a hold of a caseworker, to get a hold of a shift manager, a lawyer, a clerk, a judge, everybody's working remotely, so no one, you know, would answer the phone. Um, so then it turned into, you know, writing letters, showing up at their offices, doing everything that we could possibly do to make a statement. Um, and eventually, uh, we were able to, so eventually my brother caught COVID, um, about three or four months into fighting over the summer as it got worse. Um, he started to realize that he couldn't smell, he couldn't taste, he was getting very weak. Um, and again, it's that decision of, I'm not sure if I have it, do I go get put in a place where I know I'm going to get it and I'm not going to get the medical help? Um, or do I, you know, be transparent with the brothers on the dorm and let them know that I think it because other folks have taken that approach and I switch a bunk by the end of the dorm where we keep the door open and we work around, you know, getting a mask from, uh, they were able to get some masks from the laundry facility. So he ended up taking the route of staying inside the dorm um, and letting his brothers within the facility help work him through. Um, it was a little scary because within that week uh, that he first caught it, two other people that were taken out because they tested positive, they finally started doing tests. Um, they were taken out of the dorm. They died within 48 hours. Um, so we didn't know, and he has pre-existing conditions. Anyway, long story short, it was, it was a lot of phone calls, consistent, 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 um, antagonizing, threatening to call the media, having outsiders call, influencers call, congressmen, whoever. Um, and unfortunately that didn't actually work. By the grace of God, he got a parole hearing and was uh, released on parole um, about five and a half months into the beginning of the fight. Um, but what we did realize is that throughout all of that work, he was passing that information on to other inmates where they received um, a better response. The, uh, the unfortunate piece to all this is it's about access and it's about um, you know, accountability. These caseworkers, you know, these folks that are in the prison to be your advocate, um, many do not work for you. Many do not work at all. Don't answer the phone. In five and a half months, we never got a call back from his particular caseworker. But consistency and, you know, dedication, um, I believe, helped several other people within his dorm um, to get some kind of rhythm and eventually get out. Thank you so much for that, Ramin. It is a shame that it takes lifting heaven and earth just to get them to maybe sort of possibly respond. Imagine what families who don't have as much access or as much time as Ramin and his family had. Imagine what they're going through right now. So folks, our panelists have expertly laid out the problem that we're dealing with in New York State particularly. We talked about what the incarceration looks like. We talked about what it looks like before COVID and during COVID. And now we want to start talking about some solutions, ways that these panelists think we can engage to shift power and protect our people. And I want to bring the first question to Natasha. Natasha, can you describe some of the efforts either you support to reduce New York City's jail population or you think would help us move towards closing Rikers? And then um, Germani, I'd like you to answer that question next as well. Natasha, the floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, Rodney spoke about this pretty extensively, but bail reform has been seen as one way to reduce the population. Um, I think we really need to look at alternatives to incarceration. So before someone is actually funneled into jail, what other resources are available um, to ensure that they have some other type of option um, of accountability. Loving accountability is, is what I'm trying to get at, right? So not punishment, but how can we hold people accountable for their actions, um, but not demonize um, and put them in a worse situation by funneling them into jail. Um, I believe community courts, I'm a big supporter of that. I already mentioned um, 
as a person who has seen uh, firsthand the importance and great work that organizations do on the grounds, whether it's crisis management or other preventative measures that provide wraparound services for folks who are in need and addressing those needs are um, some things that I'm supportive and have been involved in um, through my work. Um, and again, anything that leads to preventing. I think a lot of times government is very reactionary, right? We have a problem and so we want to react to the problem even as we think about the issue around policing policing's respond to crime but they don't really deal with proactive measures or how to ensure that a crime never exists they're only responding to a crime after it has taken place and so anything that we can do to um, ensure that folks have alternatives to incarceration alternatives to policing <laughs> So the, the first line that folks have um, before they go see a judge, before they, you know, interact with the corrections officer, their interaction, they're interacting with the police officer. Um, so what what does it look like to have alternatives to policing, right? Having more social workers, incredible messengers um, to really address issues in our community um, versus having a police officer show up who has only a certain set of tools, right? They're, they're only, they can only, a police officer can only do but a few things. Um, and one of those things is arresting someone <laughs> will ultimately leads them to um, being put in jail. Thank you very much, Natasha. Um, Jemani, go ahead. Thank you. And, you know, as I said, I, you know, we have to first understand that I don't really believe that this 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 system thrives actually by having people in it. So it's more designed to keep people coming in and coming back as opposed to rehabilitating and keeping people out. Uh, so as I said before, we do have to make sure that people understand what public safety is and what public safety isn't. Everybody wants to feel safe and people play on those fears. Sometimes it's even worse when people actually are safe and don't feel safe. They still do some, some crazy things. So we have to have Democrats who are, aren't afraid of having this conversation and won't backtrack every time there's a little heat. And so we have to break up the pipelines that really keep pushing people into these uh, into these prisons. So that's what uh, decriminalization of marijuana, legalization of marijuana has been all about. Uh, decriminalization and legalization of uh, prostitution and sex work. Uh, so these things are things that are used to put people in, in jail when oftentimes uh, they need other avenues uh, that we are not funding. And so we're putting all the funding in the correctional system. Also, you know, when it comes to bail reform, we need to go back to the original terms that were put in 2019. It's the first time I've ever seen people start blaming a law before the law even went into effect. It was the craziest thing I had ever seen in my life. Uh, and we have to figure out how to better institute community supervision. So we should be planning how to keep people out of jail. And we keep figuring more ways to put them in jail to continue the system uh, uh, going. And so we have to, uh, if you're going to be there, fortunately, make sure that the carceral conditions are better. We have to end solitary confinement. We have to do that immediately. We have to make sure that uh, there are more social workers. I think there's a law that tries to require one social worker for every 10 incarcerated persons. Right now, uh, I always say all these systems are set up and designed the way that they're supposed to. That's what makes it so difficult. We have to uproot this whole thing. Uh, the way Rikers and, and, and most jails are set up is for violence to occur. Uh, and then when that violence occurs, they use that as an excuse uh, to do more harm. And so it really takes some courage to break this up. Uh, and I'm hoping that we'll really see that courage uh, going forward in the future. Uh, because if you see what's happening in, 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 um, in New York State, everybody was blaming you know, defund the police for all the blue losses and whatnot. Uh, but it looks like we're actually picking up the seats when the mail when the mail ballots came in. Uh, and that's just not true. It looks like people actually were more concerned about having defunded the summer youth programs and defunded the Department of Education. Uh, were less worried about the the uh, sham of uh, uh, fear that they were doing around conversations when it came to defund the police. And we need people who have to who have the ability to have a conversation so people can understand what it means and, and not allow people uh, to misuse it. Thank you very much, Shimani. I wanna bring it to um, Jose and then Rodney. Jose, um, and both of you guys actually have been working with a coalition pushing to, 
two parole release spells to offer meaningful opportunities. Sorry, Annie. sorry, I'm sorry. One thing I, I want to make sure uh, I, I mentioned, we have to take away the incentive uh, for people to also be in, uh, in prison, and that is uh, reducing the exploitation of prison labor. I want to make sure I put that out there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for jumping back in for that. That's very important. So Jose and Rodney, and I'll start with you, Jose. You guys are both working on two parole release bills to offer meaningful opportunities for the release of thousands of New Yorkers. Can you describe these bills? Um, so Jose, can you describe the bills? And Rodney, can you describe the impact? Yes, well, the first bill, the Fantani Parole Bill, this bill actually changes the release uh, process, the parole release process in New York State. Traditionally, and you know, for the last four or so decades, the parole commissions in New York have been denying people parole for the one thing no one can change, the nature of the crime. The Fantani Parole Bill actually eliminates that to the point where they must now determine the risk factor, where the person is a risk return back to the community based on who the person is today, not who he was or who she was decades ago. And the elder parole bill provides if a person has been 55 years old and has served 15 years, no matter what the sentence was, no matter what the crime of conviction was, this person will be entitled to a parole review. No guarantees that the parole board will release him, but at least it gives men and women who have already languished in prison for four decades, it gives them hope that they will one day return back to their family and their home community. And it will actually be a solution to the mass incarceration policies that actually put men and women in prison for extra years and decades of their lives. Thank you very much for that, Jose. And for those of you who don't know, one of the fastest growing groups in our prison systems are the elderly, or what, like ages 55 and up. We have over 10,000 just in New York State prisons and jails right now. Rodney, what will be the impact if these bills passed? I mean, the immediate impact is that, you know, so, so many people will be reconnected with their families and placed back in their communities and able to just lead uh, lives not behind walls. But I mean, you know, within the context of COVID, that means a lot more people will not, you know, contract COVID, a lot more people will not die from it, uh, and they will be released uh, to their community. So, I mean, it would be a tremendous impact, not to mention the incredible cost savings associated with parole release reform. I mean, it costs upwards of $100,000 a year in New York State uh, in many instances. And in some instances, if a person has um, a pre-existing condition or has certain medical treatments they are um, required to receive, that could be over $200,000 a year. So there are like millions of dollars that could be saved by releasing people who have served extraordinarily lengthy sentences uh, and who are frankly only being penalized. Um, uh, and reject it time and again uh, when they go before the parole board. So that's immediately necessary. And in addition to what Jose is saying, uh, just taking it back to the COVID context, because again, this is just one of the worst things we have ever seen. The governor has really got to grant emergency clemencies. Uh, there are so, so many people who are languishing right now uh, who are contracting this disease. And again, I mean, you look to Green Correctional Facility, Wyoming Correctional Facility, Bedford Hills, um, Fishkill, and I think one of the worst, Elmira, um, you're seeing extraordinary outbreaks. I mean, at Elmira, I believe nearly 40% of the population there contracted COVID. That is very, very, very alarming, and it should really keep people up at night. Uh, we have to immediately address this. Uh, and you know, in addition to the releases, which is the first and foremost priority, we have to be offering more testing. We have to allow people to socially distance. Uh, and if that's not possible, well, you know, we need to be thinking of measures to send as many people home as quickly as possible. And I mean, you know, Thousands of people are eligible for parole right now. Thousands of people are above the age of 55. Thousands of people are in for technical violations, which Donna can speak to. Um, and these people should be released uh, to avoid catastrophe that we have really seen unfold over the course of the last eight months. Thank you. I want to throw to Natasha real quick. Natasha, go ahead. Yeah. Um... I totally agree with everything that's been said, and we really need to figure out ways to deconstruct this system. Um, but one of the things I want to mention that's kind of like a, a random thing because it talks about the correction officers is specifically on Rikers, the corrections officers, if they if they need a mask, they'll get a mask, but there's like no real hard requirement. I'm hearing from folks who I know that are correction officers that they're 
primarily purchasing their own items for PPE, um, they don't have to take any tests. <laughs> so I'm thinking of other friends that work in healthcare where they're required to take um, a COVID test once a week or some type of cadence of making sure you are not positive, but they are not um, required to do that. They only are checking their temperature. And we know checking the temperature is really nothing. Um, and then they're required to answer five questions. So in addition to figuring out ways to make sure our vulnerable populations are not in jail, in addition to figuring out ways to ensure that people are not even going into jail in the first place, we also need to look at the structures that exist within our jail systems um, as some immediate ways to address and protect those who are currently incarcerated. And to me, that starts with the population that is exposing the folks who are incarcerated, right? They're, they're in a facility, but people are out in the world as in correction officers and other folks who work um, at jails and prisons, they're out in the world exposing themselves and they're coming into the prison and exposing the folks who are incarcerated. And so I was, a, I was really shocked um, to learn that there are not a lot of protocols and the correction officers themselves don't feel like folks care about their well-being. And so when we talk about conditions in jail, well, if the folks who are supposed to be um, correcting folks um, in the system are disgruntled um, and don't want to be there, how does that then translate to the interactions that they're having with people that are incarcerated? So we really need to look at like all layers of how we address this issue specifically um, in the space that we're in right now um, with the COVID pandemic. Thank you so much, Fantasia. But just real quick, I know, um, Jermani, you had to get out of here. I just want to take a second to thank you so much for being a part of this panel and a part of this conversation and for all the work that you've been doing. Oh, thank you, man. I, I appreciate that uh, so much. And this conversation is extremely, uh, extremely important. The last thing, you know, I want to say is uh, even with the correction officers, we see that the difference when your melanin is darker, uh, there actually is much concern, we, as much problems we have with them. They're the only black and brown law enforcement union, primarily women. Uh, there's no other union that would be treated the way they were uh, when it came to PPEs. Uh, and lastly, you know, it's just, it's so disgusting that this governor can't even allow people who are close to parole to just be out. That's how why did, where did we are to this program? None of, to this to the system. None of these folks were sentenced to die, and we're simply playing playing dice to see whether or not they're going to die instead of doing what's humane. And my hope is that these folks will feel it in the ballot box at some point. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Shimani. So I want to bring it to Donna. You've been working over the years to end the reincarceration of folks who commit technical parole violations. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that work? And for those of us who are listening who don't know what a technical parole violation is, can you briefly explain that? Yeah, thanks for that, Stanley. So I've been doing a whole lot more than uh, this work. Um, <laughs> but for the technical violation, so people don't understand that people get sent back to prison not not for committing a crime, but for what we would consider minor infraction or something that you would even think is an issue. Like this is New York. We're talking about the subway system, right? What does the subway system, transit system look like in New York? You're trying to get home, right? You can get stuck in a tunnel, anything can happen. So imagine you're on the subway, you're not getting home by nine o'clock or eight o'clock or whatever your curfew time is. And then you might be five minutes late. You might miss it by five minutes. You can be sent back to prison to prison for that, right? And as serious, as minor as it sounds, that's as serious as it is for someone who's on parole, those of us who've experienced parole, right? And because you can't, like I said before, you can't get a job, you can't get a job in a time frame, which depending on the parole officer and if he or she had her good cup, their good cup of coffee or good cigarette or the real, everything at home is nice and you know everybody's fine, you know, it depends. It's all, right, subjective, right? Depending on how you see and feel and then, I mean, there are other issues, mental health. Why are you continue sending somebody back to prison? Because they have mental health issues. Or you might not like the medication they're taking that their mental health doctor has prescribed for them. You think they're supposed to take something else. So I'm, I'm telling you things that we face. And so you violate them because you told them to take one thing, but the doctor to prescribe something else for them. I've actually been dealing with something like that. So you want to send somebody back to prison, a waste of money and a waste of a human being, right? Just a waste. So for what reason? 
And these are the things that we deal with. We hear these things and that's why the fear that's behind some of this, this, this um, the fear that they've been pushing, this is what they say. They never tell you this though, that a person was sent back because of a minor violation, which is really nothing for the regular Jane and John Doe has not been system impacted. You, no one is gonna send you to prison because you didn't get a job. No one's gonna send you to prison because the subway or her church mm. transit didn't get you home on time, right? And so you missed whatever show, you've missed it by five or 10 minutes, right? No one's gonna send you to prison because, oh, well, I probably have too many glasses of wine right now, right? No one's, gonna, I mean, it just doesn't make sense, but this is what people that are on parole face all the time. We walk on eggshells all the time. We are, I mean, no matter what we do, we have to do it gingerly so that we don't, we don't cause the parole officer, whoever that might be, to have a problem. We don't, we don't get an interaction with the police officer because we're walking while black and brown. We're walking and heaven forbid any, something happens and they pull you, you know, they want your ID and check your ID and you're in the system. It's over. I'm just saying. You know, so these things, and so we we we're kind of trapped in these in these in these areas. We're trapped in so many things, and for those of us, it means our life. It means that we can simply just be sent back upstate for absolutely nothing, wow. nothing that me, that makes any sense. And and instead, to Natasha's point, is to have sit, um, programs in place to fortify these places, do something with them. There are many community um 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 programs that exist. That could be, um, we can give money to. We're wasting million, billion. This is a billion dollar industry. And to what Jamani said, they don't want this to um, go away. They don't want this to go away because we are and will always be to them a dollar sign, black bodies, period. Donna, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, she, she really painted a really clear picture about the system and how they want to hold people in space. Topeka, we know you have several efforts in helping to decarcerate the system. Um, we'd love it if you can just share with us like, like one or two things you're doing right now that like is helping to push to decarcerate the system. Absolutely. So, um, you know, in one of my many hats, I'm also senior advisor for New Yorkers United for Justice. And um, it's where we, the work that we're doing there is really to support. It's like an inside outside game. So we have advocates who've been doing the work we heard about the parole reform and things that people are looking to pass and will pass, Lord willing, um, next session. But there's also the relationships that need to be built with the elected officials. And that's where the inside outside game comes in so we can make sure that that's done. And so we play a critical role in that effort. Additionally, making sure to everyone's point that there is a clemency effort and push for people to be released immediately. Um, and so working to make sure that that's happening in New York specifically. The other thing that we're doing um, at the Ladies of Hope Ministries is making sure that there are opportunities for housing for women around the country. So as I said, we recently opened a house in New Orleans. We're opening up in Baltimore, Maryland. We're opening up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and in Brooklyn. Um, so we're scaling rapidly. And that part of that is to make sure that when people are released, that they have somewhere to go. Because at the end, we're wanting to make sure that people are safe. Yes, again, I always echo, there is legislative efforts that have to happen. Absolutely, we need to get our people home and reconnect them to their families. Absolutely, but if they don't have somewhere to live, if they don't have food in their stomach and they don't have opportunities for sustainable and equity um, within their communities, we're gonna have this vicious cycle of abuse and state violence against our people. And so that's what we do, that's what we sit. And thank you so much for putting this together. Thank you so much, Shapika. And before you know, we, we close out this, close this out, I just want to give Ramin one more chance to speak. As someone who is like directly impacted and has a family member who just went through this, we've heard about a lot of things people are doing to address the system. It does this feel like a good start. Is there something else you think we should be doing? You know, the issue is is that when when folks come home, there's still um, there's there was there's still a problem, right? You have the uh, parole, probation and parole office that, you know, at the time when the numbers were really rising, they had been shut down too. So coming home and not being able to go right to work, my brother has a, had his own mechanic shop for years, but for almost two months could not get back in the shop to, to get work, right? Um, and as we're seeing numbers rise, uh, 
you know, basically every day, 100,000 people. I mean, we can only expect more of this to come. So more of our brothers and sisters are going to be locked inside behind gates without access to get home. And the lucky ones that do come home will be home with nowhere to go, nowhere to bring any money in and another, you know, drain on whoever's pocket that they're lucky enough to live with. Um, you know, if, and when you have a family of your own, when you have a few kids and, you know, a house and a mortgage payment or, or whatever your circumstances are, um, you know, I think that's where we need to start thinking about, you know, is it a fund? Is it connecting folks with wraparound services that are local so that there is money directed to folks that are coming home with no access and no um, ability to earn over the next uh, few months as we all go back into lockdown. Thank you so much for that, Ramin. So folks, thank you very much to these great panelists. I wanna give it back to Luis, but before I do, if you guys can just hold, turn your cameras off and hold off for a little bit, because we're gonna come back at the end to close this out. But thank you so much for this great conversation. Thank you so much for your time. And Luis, the floor is yours again. Thank you so much, Dan Lee, and everyone who was just involved in that panel. It was a really engaging conversation, and I look forward to bringing us all together at the end of the program. I think in a lot of ways, that conversation set the tone um, for what we were about to discuss, um, the really parole system's counterpart of probation and youth and juvenile detention that we're seeing, not only in New York, but across the country. But first, it is my honor to introduce some of my colleagues to join me in this conversation on youth probation and prison reform. First, I want to introduce Tony Gladling. Tony is a dedicated youth advocate born and raised in Stockton, California, recognizing the harsh realities and disparity of our black, of black and brown young people as it relates to the justice system. Tony has been committed to following his passion and serving systems impacted youth across San Joaquin County. He hopes to continue to foster sustainability, resilience, civic and community engagement for our most vulnerable populations. Welcome, Tony. I want to introduce Aaliyah Guillory Nickens. Aaliyah is an 18 year old teen activist from Harlem. Since the age of 15, she has dedicated herself to using her voice to speak up and fight against injustices that her and other young people in her community face. She's worked to help pass raise the age laws in New York so that 16 and 17 year olds will no longer be charged as adults. And Aaliyah is now an active member of Justice League NYC, Soul Sisters Leadership Collective, and a community member of Nan Youth Huddle. Mm -hmm most recently founded a new community organization called Coalition of Passionate Youth. Welcome, Aaliyah. I think I see you on here. And I also want to welcome Zarini Iman. Zarini Iman is an organizer from New York who has been focused on justice reform and violence prevention since high school. Mm -hmm. Now a junior at the University of Pennsylvania, Zarina advises Youth Over Guns, which she co-founded in 2018 and serves as a member of Justice Against NYC, which she joined in 2015. In college, Jarena has had the privilege to pursue her interest in criminal law and decarceration, both mm -hmm. academically and in the field, most recently serving as policy and as a policy and research associate for the House Judiciary Committee, working with one of the nation's most progressive DAs, Larry Krasner, and serving as a supporter with Why Not Prosper, a Philadelphia-based reentry nonprofit. Welcome, everyone. The realities of incarceration are damning. Youth confined in juvenile corrections institutions are exposed to alarming levels of violence and abuse. And now the very serious issue of COVID-19, a pandemic that has hit us all way too hard. Recidivism rates for youth released from juvenile correctional facilities are almost uniformly high. And in contrast with common perceptions, the majority of youth placed in facilities nationwide are not guilty of serious violent crimes. And despite high costs and troubling results, most states, including New York, continue to devote the bulk of their juvenile justice budgets to correctional institutions and other facility placements. As we heard with the systems impacting our adult counterparts, all measures in these systems are punitive. Last month, the sentencing project revealed that more than 1,800 incarcerated youth had tested positive for COVID-19. And really, I wanna pose a question to you all about the fact that whether or not young people are accountable to crimes, none of us and none of them were really sentenced to death by a deadly pandemic. And so I'd love if you can just share with the audience, 
what are some things that lawmakers can do right now to ensure their safety and, and in reality ensure their livelihoods as we see COVID-19 is sweeping through prisons and jails across the country and alarmingly impacting the livelihoods of young folks who are incarceration right now? Zareen, if you'd like to chime in. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think an immediate uh, thing that can be done is basically to just start releasing people. I mean, you you pointed out the issue correctly. Um, this system is overly retributive um, and it's not just meant to be retributive. There should be an aspect of rehabilitation, especially with youth. Um, legal scholars across the field have recognized that youth, regardless of what your opinions of adults are, youth offenders are not as culpable just given their age and that's something lawmakers have even recognized by lowering or raising the age at which youth can um be incarcerated and be incarcerated for long periods of time um even in a well semi-recent supreme court case miller v alabama you know um uh youth in from 2016 youth were um youth that are sentenced to life without parole, those, pro those um, sentences are now unconstitutional. So we recognize that youth don't have, that youth can do very little to deserve the full extent of punishment that adults receive. And as such, they shouldn't be sentenced to these life sentences and there should be other triage programs to get them out of this. Um, and while those programs aren't in place right now, they should, one, what we should learn from this is that they should be instituted later. And two, what we can do right now is we can start releasing these people back to their families and their communities um, who can care for them best at this moment in time. Thank you so much. A lot of sort of what we heard in the previous panel, and even with what you just mentioned right now is the urgency to release young people. I think the question that arises when we release young people, um, particularly those who are under-resourced, might not have a home to go to, um, might not have the services or, or resources to thrive after release. What are some of the things that we can do to make sure that they can successfully re-enter society? And open for you all to chime in. I, I agree. Um, and thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm glad to be here with you all and have this conversation and, and just kind of join in what we're the work that's kind of going on. I think 100% for sure getting uh, releasing them back to their families, releasing them back to their home counties where they could best be served. I think also in addition to that, it is a valid question. Like, what do, then what? Like, what do you do with them then at that point? I think that's when you really get into like funding and, and, and defunding certain programs and reallocating funds and, and reinvesting and uh, divesting and, and um, in different entities or organizations that maybe shouldn't be there, like like school district police, stuff like that, like reallocating those funds and really kind of for sure, also for the community and for people to understand that defunding does not necessarily mean like take them down, like take them apart. It's just literally taking funds away the same way that uh, educational systems have been defunded. They still exist, but they've just been they've just been defunded. So I think really using that fund to allocate that into community-based organizations, to social services, to mental health services, to, and things like that to kind of um, so we can afford them better service and better care. Absolutely, yeah. And something sort of I wanted to follow back on is the reality that states like New Jersey have adopted models like the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative, where we've seen a 72.5% decrease in average daily population for juvenile detention centers. This decrease results on over 8,000 youth um, less being admitted into detention facilities on an annual basis. Would love to hear from you, Tony, um, as someone who works with young people. What are some of the real life experiences of young people who are released and why is there an urgency for states to adopt models like these that, that really allow young people a second chance, um, but also sort of open up the, the opportunity to move beyond the justice system and, and not have sustained um, engagement with these really harmful um, systems of incarceration and supervision. For sure, I think working with these young people, I, I think one of the huge reasons why and on a daily basis that, that they're incarcerated at such massive rates and disproportionate rates is because they, there is a, a lack of understanding for like where they're coming from or what they have come through and the trauma that they face uh, and that they have faced throughout their, their entirety of their life. So I think that um, 
judging them or, or responding based on behavior is not appropriate or at all fair to them. So when we're out there, when, when they finally get out and they are become engaged with these community-based organizations and these individuals that are, that are trained and that are ready to accept them, there's an opportunity and a space afforded to them to be able to kind of think through thought process and kind of deal with the unresolved traumas and deal with the, uh, and, and, and actually take part in that healing process to understand like what they can, um, what they can become, what they can offer, what they can do and the different alternatives because there's such a lack of, of, of awareness of resources for them and uh, such a lack of awareness of what, what they can do and where they can be. So that's one of the biggest things too. Uh, and I think also secondly, if I may say, uh, setting the expectation higher in terms of like for setting an expectation for them, like you, you can't achieve this. And that's one of the re most real life experiences that I had with young people, which it was even daunting a daunting task for me as the adult working with them because that wasn't what I was used to or that wasn't what the system uh, fosters when you come into it and I was like well I'm we're gonna like literally down to like set goals right like let's just set some goals and I was nervous because no one expects them to set goals it's like we're expecting you we're waiting for you to fail again so when I went in there to, to set the goals and like let's let's kind of let's raise the bar a little bit because you can and once they begin to, to reach the goals and once they begin to have little bits of successes things that we may not even consider as adults that's when you can start to see that uh, be perpetuated. Absolutely, absolutely. That's so spot on, especially as we think about sort of the importance to, to engage young people in meaningful ways um, beyond punitive measures. Uh, you talked about sort of moving away from funding uh, of systems that don't work. And Zarina touched a, a bit on sort of young people who have been sentenced and some of those decisions that have been overturned as we've seen them to be far too punitive. One thing that we fought for here in New York is raise the age um, to make sure we're keeping young people safe. And I know that fights continue to make sure that we're raising the age right. Ali, I want to bring you in into this question. Um, why do you feel it's so important to fight for, for the raising of, of the age of criminal responsibility? And what do you think we need to do here in New York? Um, thank you. Good, ev good evening. Um, I think one thing that it's so well, first, I think it's so important that we fight for raise the age to remind young people that the mistakes you make while you're young isn't going to define you for the rest of your life, your adult life, you know, um, especially raising the first step that we did was raise the age from 16, 17, you know, giving young people that chance, you know, so when they're when they're still 16 they won't be charged as an adult um we're still trying to raise that age from 17 because when you're 17 you're still not an adult when you're 18 you're not an adult you're not fully an adult till after you're 21 years old so you shouldn't be charged as an adult until after 21 years old um i think raising age is so important you know to give young people that hope you know so they don't lose hope they don't lose faith they don't feel like once they enter the system there's no getting out. So, you know, they keep on um, falling into that trap. You know, one thing we can remember to do in New York is not to um, forget that the fight isn't finished. You know, just just because we pass certain laws and we pass certain bills, that doesn't mean the fight is over. We still have to push for more laws. We still have to, um, there's still other issues that we have to push for, ending solitary confinement for youth, um, making sure children under 12 aren't being prosecuted, um, getting all the, cops and school safety workers out of um, schools, things like that. We have to remember that just because one thing is passed, that doesn't mean that the fight is over, that the fight is nowhere near over. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. And I think as we think about mass incarceration and the ways in which these systems is impacting young people, something that's often overlooked is mass supervision. Really, the, a, a system that funnels our loved ones into jails, prisons, and detention centers and all different corners of our country. Probation and parole have grown far too long because people are being supervised who should not be supervised and being kept under supervision for far too long. Last year, President Trump noted that 3,000 individuals were released from prison thanks to the First Step Act, yet each day we're sending 95,000 more people to prison in their place. We're sending them there not because they've committed new crimes, but because they have violated conditions of parole and or probation. Why do you all feel that's happening and what can we do in this moment to change it? Um, I think it comes down to what we're criminalizing. I think we're being what we have a tendency to be overly harsh. And I think it's just a rooted part of the justice system at this point, um, just given the way it was created and the prejudices and everything that went into creating it. 
Um, so I really think it comes down to what we're criminalizing. And we tend to not see people, incarcerated people as human. I think there's a fundamental lack of human, of like humanness in the process. And that you can see that everywhere. You can see that where we, um, we don't like, there, our systems does, doesn't really allow or, you know, have specific procedures for contacting families and stuff like that. And so if we, if our system um, fundamentally like dehumanizes people and overly criminalizes people, we're basically allowing, we result, the result is not allowing people to make mistakes. And when you're not allowing people to make mistakes, and especially you're not allowing young kids to make mistakes, um, what you're going to get is a lot of mistakes. And then a, as a result, a lot of violations of parole. Um, and that's kind of, I think, why we continue to see the system. I, I want to say on that point too, again, it, down to what we are criminalizing, I agree with that 100%, because I think we're just over criminalizing people um, in, at, at disproportionate rates. And I think also there's a lack of really focusing on like the root causes and the root issues and actually doing true restorative work. I think, uh, and that's right there is what we can't settle for, like word to what Aaliyah said, I agree. Like there, I'm glad that these things are happening. I'm glad that now with COVID's here, we're recognizing that, you know, like this is a problem, something needs to happen to these young people. We need to understand also that youth prisons were dangerous to them well before COVID-19. And COVID has just worsened the, the state of that, right? So now people are recognizing it, but still understanding like, while I'm appreciative that this attention is getting drawn to it, it's still not enough, right? And we still have to look at the root causes. We cannot take these things that are like Band-Aid fixes where, where we're transferring, you know, uh, power or we're, we're giving a little bit of funding here or we're calling a program a certain name. Like that's just, that's still not enough. What are we actually doing to, to produce re true restorative work that actually changes the system or challenges the system or builds a new one? that is going to allow these people to prosper and, and live those, those lives and reintegrate into society the way that they should have always been. Um, piggybacking off of what both of you said, um, that ties into the school to prison pipeline and you know the over criminalization inside the schools, which leads um, young people in to these prisons, the zero tolerance policies, you know, not giving young people a chance to make a mistake, you know, constantly criminal 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 criminalizing them for making mistakes. Um, little things like um, maybe dress code or um, coming to class late, you know, then that leads to detention, suspensions, you know, and then those things leads to them being put in a system, you know, they probably was never a bad kid to even enter the system, but things like that in schools, you know, pushes them like pushes and forces them into the system. And, you know, that's when they get trapped in. And that's another problem that we have to face, which we have to address as well. Absolutely. And I want to get into the piece about um, repairing and restoring harm. But before that, Aliyah, would love to hear from you sort of your, your connection to the probation system in, in, in New York, right? Understanding that you yourself have peer, peers in our community with people who have endured what it's like to be under that system, what it's like to be under supervision. How has that shown up and in what ways do you see it really affecting the day-to-day the -day livelihood of young people? Um, I feel like it doesn't really help at all. I mean, the intentions, they say that it is supposed to, you know, it's a second chance for young people, you know, rather than being incarcerated, they get probation, but it's not really a second chance. You know, it's, it's like you said, it's supervising them, you know, it's like, um, it's, a foot on their neck constantly you know you got to check in all the time you got to have a curfew you got to do this you got to do that but when you think of a second chance that's not what you think when you think of probation it should be something like where you're helping young people with their mental health you're giving them economic opportunities you know training construction training business training any type of training they need you know that's that's what you think when you think of probation you don't think of um something where they have to constantly check in with their PO or they have to um, go to a program with a bunch of older people where they don't really get their voices heard, but it's mandatory or they're getting remanded. You know, it's not it's not really helping them. It's, right, it's hurting them rather than helping them. So we have to um, look at it different and see how we can repair that because the sole purpose of probation is to give kids a second chance so they don't go to jail, but that's not what it's doing. It's leading them to, um, to um, commit 
more criminal activities, which is not helping but hurting them. Absolutely. That, that touches on the piece about recidivism. And I think you, you hit the nail on the head with that one. I think when we think about the purposes of probation and really it's, it's foundation of in the 1800s when this system first came about, what was the purposes of it? What, what were folks wanting to do um, with young folks who were, who were being impacted by these systems? And what was the true core of um, the system of probation? And really it was community reintegration, um, really originally designed as a community supervision to, to, to all, that oftentimes served and, and now serves as a trap wire to imprisonment, um, which, which creates a vicious cycle of reincarceration for people who are under supervision and administrative rules that can easily, anything you do can be a violation. I mean, from what the realities of not being able to afford public transportation and, and hopping a bus. I've seen young people across the state of New York, really here in the city even, who've been reincarcerated because of small infractions like that. Any small encounter that you have with the police can lead to the reincar reincarceration when you're under supervision of the parole or the probation systems. And so especially for young people where any little thing you do can, can lead to a mistake, whether it be showing up to school late, getting into a dispute at school, being kicked out, police show up. When, when we think about the police system and, and how that affects young people in New York, that ties directly into these probation systems. Young folks cannot avoid over-policing in New York City, cannot avoid stop and frisk in New York City, cannot avoid everyday encounters with the police. Yet for all those infractions, for all of those things, that can easily land them right back into jails. And it's why people like my brother, um, Pedro Hernandez, was, was really recognized for not allowing the system to put that tag on him. A lot of times we, we see it as an opportunity to get out. Uh, as someone who sat in courts for months, I really saw a lot of young people take that as their only two for release. Because as we heard from folks like Rodney earlier, bail was something that was not affordable. The cash bail system is something that has really destroyed families and, and continues to destroy families for as long as we continue to do rollbacks on, on sort of the, the large systems-wide push and restore that we had implemented early 2020. And so as we continue to rely on systems of supervision to be our community reentry, we're going to continue to see the reincarceration of our people. We're going to continue to see it creating and causing harm. And so I wanted to come back to that, to that topic that both you, Tony and Zarina touched on about young people and really how to restore and repair harm outside of supervision. What do you feel like young people need um, that we can be providing as communities that, that resources are out there for that might need more investment to really restore and repair that harm that has been created? I think that number one, I think we have to recognize the reality of there are other alternatives. Like I hate the idea that probation is the second chance, like, or like, you know, that getting on probation is the second chance to reintegrate into society. Like how come that, that chance, that second chance to reintegrate into society can't be a community-based organization or can't be an advocate or, or an activist or someone like that or the, those types of programs. The idea that we refer out to a punitive system to be the second chance, I think is the, is the issue as well because they shouldn't be there in the first place. So like, how can we like really restore that? And I think that, again, there, there are definitely, while, while there has been work that has been going towards that, at least in California with the uh, Department of Juvenile Justice and how that's going to be turned over into uh, health and human services and stuff like that, I think understanding too, like when these, all these young people are going to be sent back to their home counties, that we be prepared and build the capacity to be able to accept them and, and deal with them trauma informed, to be able to work with them, to restore all that time that was lost, but also to restore the trauma that even got them there in the first place, right? So how can we provide those spaces and, and being able to be there, having these conversations with them that are truly, and it's, it's gonna be a process, it's a long process, but again, that's a, a huge reason why people do rely on law enforcement because it's just a quick fix or a quick cover up, but it's the, the process in which it takes to be able to truly work to restore, uh, it takes time and it's gonna take a commitment from all of us community members and the, to, to accept that, that responsibility because it is our responsibility as community members to our young people. Absolutely, would love for you to chime in Zarina. 
Yeah, um, I totally agree. Um, I think that like funding just needs to go to a variety of places um, in terms of like mental health services um, to sort out trauma as Tony mentioned, um, as well as, you know, making sure we're getting kids back on track in school, um, making sure they have other like ways to other like outputs, essentially, like other ways to, um, you know, like exercise or, you know, to talk to one another, just all sorts of um, anything that we think creates like a full sort of cultural life um, and a communal life, I think that's what needs to be funded instead of um, emphasizing punitive measures and pro like parole or, or probation, things like that. Um, we just need to emphasize, like at the end of the day, these are kids and they still have time to learn and grow and we should foster that the the part of them that is learning, growing, and that will eventually end up creating, um, instead of, you know, confining that um, and putting them in jail or putting them on probation. Absolutely, that's spot on. And something you, Tony, touched based on earlier was some of the sort of implementation of legislation that's happening in recent years. Um, recently, within the last decade, um, California implemented. Um, Senate Bill 678, which provided financial incentives to county probation departments to reduce the number of people um, on probation being sent to prison. In its first year, probation violation rates declined by 23%. Really, the California Department of Finance estimated that because of this reduction, over 6,000 people on probation, over 6,000 less people um, entered on probation entered state prisons in, in recent years. And so we've seen up to date, that's generated a savings of $179 million. And as we think about sort of financial investment and disinvestment in these systems, what what is California doing and leading on that states like New York and Philadelphia and other respective on places that we're working in can be modeling after? Yeah, for sure. So one of the things that goes into effect or the first phase that goes into effect in July, 2021, is that uh, the Department of Juvenile Justice, which is that punitive system, will stop taking new intakes at the time. Obviously, it is going to take some time to, to funnel out all of the young people that have that are incarcerated there. But it's going to switch over again, like I said, to uh, Health and Human Services, a new, a new division within there called the Office of Youth and uh, Community Re Re Restoration. Um, so, so with that, when that transfer happens, again, it's going to open up uh, huge funding opportunities and allocate funds. SB, as, as uh, 823 is gonna allocate funds to counties that they can be, that they can make themselves eligible to apply for, uh, to be able to kind of grow capacity and grow facilities and stuff like that, to be able to take care of these young people or to see how we can deal with them long-term. So that's kind of what we're, what we're doing. I, I think also to, to the point initially that, that, that I wanted to raise as well, is recognizing that there also is a huge disparity of our black and brown young people that are incarcerated and that are being subject to these types of things. So also understanding too that this is, it's, it, obviously yes, it, youth incarceration is a huge issue, but also particularly our black and brown young people, what are we doing to better serve them as well? Because again, at disproportionate rates, uh, I believe it's like, it's like 80% of the DJJ population is black and brown young people. So like, and how can we kind of deal with that, right? And when, when it comes back to the county and how can we kind of like dismantle that type of or, or lower that disparity? Absolutely. Uh, and just to sort of piggyback on that, it, it's really clear that black and brown young bodies are attached to dollars. And, and at the core of all of this, the real reason why we're, we're seeing young people on systems like probation and parole, um, incarcerated, for, for petty offenses is because that's what allows these systems to continue. Um, we heard from some of our previous panelists that a lot of what's going on right now is when people are incarcerated, more money is funneled into these jails, prisons, and detention centers for them to thrive. They need people within them in order to sustain themselves. And so decarceration isn't a method that those who enjoy prison culture, those who enjoy seeing people behind bars, those who enjoy the resources that comes with all of that, it's not something that they're willing to, to stand by, um, but something that we need to work on. And so would love to bring in, um, and, and as a closing, hear from Aliyah and Zarina on some of the re some of the things we can be doing to detach 
um, young people from the monetary dollars that are in these systems, as well as push for reforms across the board um, from probation to raise the age um, to decarceration, and many other factors that are landing young people in jail. Um, I think the first step we need to do, um, it was mentioned earlier, um, get to the root causes of these problems, you know, figure out what is it that's making these young people, like, you know, the specific young people that get in trouble a lot, what is it that's making them act out? Why are they acting out? Not just, okay, they're acting out, we're going to send them to jail, you know, they're going to give profit off of what are they doing that keeps on sending them to jail. And then after you get to that problem, after you get to the root cause of that problem, figure out solutions, you know, instead of constantly just looking at them as the bad guys, figure out how can we fix this, you know, and then when they're placed back in their communities, instead of looking at them like as an outcast, oh, this is the bad kid from the block, what help does that bad kid from the block need to become um, a better person, how to make them successful. So it can, um, it can less, it can like, it, it won't make them easier to go back to jail and um, get caught up in the system. Yeah, and I agree. And in addition to that, I think something that we can push for and that um, people outside can push for is divestment from the prison, ind um, prison industrial complex. Um, you know, a lot of the times, um, like, uh, like things like phone calls, um, meals, everything is paid for and is, is, and someone's profiting off of it. It's not just paid for um, at, you know, an equal value. There are people making profits and they shouldn't be making profits. So we need to regulate um, what, regulate those multiple industries that are involved. And we need to ultimately divest um, a lot of, uh, institutions, whether they necessarily know it or are fully aware of it or not, including colleges and universities, are invested in some way in the prison industrial complex. And I think the second we start divesting and it starts becoming less profitable, there'll be less of a push to send people to jail. Thank you. That's spot on. Tony, any closing remarks? Uh, yeah, sure. I, again, I, I truly agree and I, and I second with that, like just uh, divesting those populations and also understanding too that with the over-policing of our black and brown young people and the huge disparity, like let's let's just stop over-policing them first. Like we, they're being over-policed and over-criminalized for being black and brown and stopping stopping that from happening because uh, it's not a coincidence that they're the, the highest rate in our prison system. Uh, so what we, yeah, once we start pulling dollars and start making that like a profitable thing or uh, and stop showing that like that you get dollars for them, we have to take that take that away and be able to kind of invest that money into other places and other entities to be able to better serve our young people uh, with a more informed approach and also just truly uh, community healing, uh, reintegration to society and things like that. Um, there's much work to be done. Again, while I, like I said, while we are grateful that these things are happening, like the, the closing of youth prisons, we also have to be prepared for what's to come with that because that's just not an end all be all. Uh, so what are we gonna do beyond that? How are we going to build capacity and equip ourselves beyond that to be able to accept this population of people and work with them to truly restore and transform what we know these systems to be and how can we make these people be uh, successful and great people for our communities. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, um, Tony. I want you all to stay on the panel, but I also want to bring back our, our previous panel um, as we close to share some remarks as well as um, share really what are some things that we could be doing actively in, in the upcoming year to address all of these things that we've discussed. So Stanley, I want to pass it to you um, to share what are, what are some of the priorities in New York and what are we looking at um, to, to really push for and, and really what's the New York state checklist on um, that, that advocates should be looking at and working on? Sure, so the New York state checklist is pretty long. Before I go to the checklist, if you're listening right now and you're not a part of an organization, find an organization to be your political home. I would recommend Gathering for Justice or RAP or Forward or Citizen Action if you're nasty, right? But find your organization home and organize there um make sure like you're building power somewhere as far as the new york the new york state checklist we've got elder parole 
We've got halt solitary confinement. We got marijuana legalization. We have some sentencing laws that we can help to reduce sentencing at the state level. There's a laundry list of bills and campaigns that you can be a part of. I would talk to people who are doing the work in real time, like Miss Donna, like Rodney, like Lewis. Talk to those folks so we can keep on making things happen. Thanks, Lewis. And Donna and Rodney, if you all can chime in and just share a bit about what are some of your focuses for the upcoming year and what are you all hoping to work on um, come 2021? Go ahead, Ernie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I simply echoing everything Stanley just listed here, but I mean, in addition to that, um, holding the line on bail reform, um, we, you know, one beautiful part about that reform is that right now so so many people are home with their families and avoiding the worst of this pandemic and maintaining their housing and their jobs um, because this reform was passed um, but unfortunately those rollbacks meant that more people would be exposed to pretrial incarceration and we can't afford more rollbacks we frankly need to be liberating more folks and offering more pretrial freedom uh, to more folks um, as this pandemic worsens and to just ensure that folks who are legally innocent are not subject to incarceration uh, simply because they can't make uh, a bail payment. Um, but beyond that, decarceration uh, more broadly is extraordinarily necessary. I mean, the parole reform bills absolutely need to be passed. I'll kick it to Donna to just talk about uh, you know, the need to pass less is more. But I mean, all these efforts are just incredibly necessary to just reduce our reliance on this carceral system that has really taken, chewed up and spit out uh, so, so many black and brown uh, and marginalized lives. And it's something that we have to stop uh, and stop immediately. Yeah, I'll just echo um, what uh, Rodney just said, but I want to be clear too. I just have to, you know me, I wouldn't be Donna Hilton and this leader in this movement if I never bring it back to some things that are important. So when we're talking about homes and places that are central to organizing and the work and stuff like that, let's make sure we remember those women, women-led organizations like I have, right? And others that are doing the work that are out here, boots on the ground. We've been going working through this time of COVID, making sure we feed our communities, feed the women inside and make sure they get PPE and also our communities and organizing and stand and 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 galvanizing people, mobilizing to get people to come out and protest with us as we protest the conditions within prison. Uh, thank you, Jose, for coming back on because like, it's important. This is what we've been doing. We're doing this work. It's real for us. It's, 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 it's more than just real. We see the effects and listening to our young people just talk. And I remember going into prison, you know, being arrested and, and, and on Center Records Island. I was an adolescent. It's never lost on me. It's never lost on me. It's why I do the work. You know, it might not be perfect in the work, but it comes from that place, you know, and it's real. It's real. And then when I hear the fear and I hear the lies and they keep talking about our people in such ways, like we don't exist, we're not there, we're nothing but monsters and criminals and all these things which are just lies. So they roll back things, they roll back things and it only affects us. It only affects our people. We have millionaires that can pay their way out all the time and they're serial killers, let's be clear, <laughs> right? We want to point fingers and, and, and blame. Right. But I just want to really roll it back and say, women, we're out here. We're doing the work as well. Come help us. You know, it's a lonely space to be in. We need the help. We need the support. Come help us. Mobilize with us. We have we, we're fighting for real things. We don't want to see anybody reincarcerated for not committing a crime. And even if they commit a crime, we don't want to see anybody reincarcerated if they don't have fair, equitable and just, you know, um, uh, processes. Right. We don't want that to happen. It needs to stop. We need to make sure our communities have what they need. We need to make sure that our children have what they need. Women, men, all of us have what we need. And that's what we're out here doing. So less is more is definitely important. If we would get less is more passed, we would get a quarter of the population on for Rikers Island right now, right? And other, um, we're not even talking about the other county jails across New York state, right? If we were to get, um, and I'll let Jose speak to that, but the elder parole and fair and time parole, we'll get so many people out. This is important. We're all in this together. So let's not leave anyone out, but let's make sure we do the work and understand that we're not just fighting for ourselves. We're fighting for our future and we're fighting for our lives. Absolutely, the work and really that you all are doing, but specifically you, Donna, it is, it's really a testament to how 
our movements um, show up as intergenerational, as intersectional, as understanding of the multifaceted ways that we all need to collectively win together and organize to win together. And so we'd love to bring in you, Jose, to share a bit about um, what are some of your focuses come 2021 and what are some of the things that folks can, should be on the lookout for? Yes, I think we have to look that we're, we're actually looking at a super majority in both houses. The Democrats won't have a super majority in both houses. We have to take advantage of this. We have to make legislation that uproots the legacy of racism, that transforms the entire criminal legal system, where it serves the interests of our people, Black and Latino people that have been victimized by this system. We got to make these corrective measures now because we may not get another chance in, in the next 10, 20 years. So we have to put our electors to the task of passing legislation like the elder parole bill, the fair and tiny parole bill that will go a long way, a, a, a real big first step to transforming this entire legal system and reunite families that have been separated for a generation. Thank you so much, Jose. Anyone else have any closing remarks that you would like to share or share any ways in which folks can be tapping into the work that you're specifically doing and supporting some of your initiatives? I'll just say briefly here uh, that obviously, yes, while we are who we need to get connected, get connected to those community organizations, get connected to people, or even if it's just an individual that kind of that is a part of the movement and doing the groundwork. But I think also too holding our elected, our local elected officials or the powers that be accountable to to these to these new legislations and accountable to who's going to be sitting on that board like that for California. In order to be eligible for the funding, we have to be a board with chief probation officers and DA's office and public defenders and really to look at them and say, no, we know what's going on. We know what has to be. So let's hold you accountable because who's going to be on these boards? Who's going to be actually making the calls? who's going to be part of the influential process. So really holding uh, our elected officials and the powers that be accountable to best serve our young people, best serve all incarcerated populations, who's gonna do that work. So that, that's one thing that I would encourage all of our people to do. And I just wanna say that any um, young people watching that you should get involved as early as possible. Um, I think now more than ever, um, organizations need you and or will be willing to take you on. Um, and also there are lots of great youth organizations like Youth Over Guns, which Lewis and I are a part of, um, but also other organizations that will help you get to where you need to go. Also adding to that for the young people that's watching, um, like she said, get involved. Um, there's no specific way you have to be. You don't have to talk a certain way. You don't have to dress a certain way um, to get involved, to, you know, to become an advocate and advocate for what you need. Um, you could be from any place in the world. Um, as long as you're passionate about it, speak up, you know, do your thing. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you all so much um, for sharing your words, sharing your time with us, uh, and really for your commitment to doing this. I think as I think forward, forwardly thinking of the ways in which we could truly decarcerate, um, get our people out of jails, prisons, and detention centers in every corner of this country, um, get pregnant women out of prisons, get young folks out of jails, really finally close down Rikers Island. We can't wait till 2024. There's things that we could do right now to dramatically reduce the populations. There's things that we could do right now in the age of COVID-19 to get folks out. Because again, people were not sentenced to, dead, to death by a deadly pandemic. And, and many of these folks in these systems aren't even by law technically have committed a crime. Because again, we need to continue to really examine the system and, and the ways in which it's talked about itself. Folks should be considered innocent until proven guilty un, under the eyes of the, of the law. And so many of these folks, over 40% of the population specifically on Rikers are, are folks who have not even been convicted of any crime, yet still they're being held in these facilities that we've seen COVID not only take the lives of so many of them, but also impact them in, in ways that is irreparable. The, the harm that's been created to throw out the system, it has led to the disposure of so many of us and we can't allow that to continue. And so I wanna thank everyone who's tuned in um, and thank all the panelists, Ramina Minzada, Stanley Fritz, Tony Gladney, Aliyah Guillory-Nickens, Zarini Mon, 
Rodney Holcomb, Donna Hilton, Jose Hamza Saldana, Topeka Sam, public advocate Jumani Williams and Natasha Williams so much for joining us. Please continue to follow the, these incredible leaders who remain on the front lines of this work and the movement. And if you like what you heard today, please follow us at any time at NY Justice League and at Gather for Justice on Twitter and Instagram. These are all of our partners. These are people who we love and people we're closely in space with, people we highlight. Please continue to share your time, resources, and energy with all the incredible panelists that you heard from today and to keep updated with the work that we're doing and everything that's coming forward. You can text police free schools to 97779. Again, that's police free schools to 97779. And finally, you can support the Gathering for Justice's work by making a donation on Cash App at dollar sign gathering number four justice, by texting the gathering to 44321, or visit our website gatheringforjustice.org. The Gathering is truly blessed to be in community with so many incredible people, and we want to thank you all again for tuning in. A large part of this work and our commitment continues for another 15 years. As an organization who's, who's in its 15th anniversary year and committed to doing this work now more than ever around decarceration, we hope that you will join us at this end of the year to envision justice and support our work as we continue to look into the pathways of decarceration, ending and disrupting the systems of the school to prison pipeline, continuing to close down youth prisons around the country and continue to support and uplift the leadership of young people who are actively engaged in this work. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in.